Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome to the Candidate Forum for Districts 11 and 10 of the U.S. House of Representatives. This forum is sponsored by the League of Women Voters, a 104-year-old nonpartisan organization that never supports nor opposes candidates or political parties. This forum is co-sponsored by 11 other nonpartisan organizations. I am Alpha Woolen, and I am the moderator. If you want to ask questions, call the number on the screen, which is 571-749-1142. We will use as many questions as possible. The candidates for District 11, sorry, the candidate for District 11 is Mr. Jerry Connolly and Mr. Mike Van Meter. They will speak during the first segment. In the second segment, we will hear from candidates for District 10, Suha Subramanyam and Mike Clancy. Each candidate will have two minutes for an opening segment, for an opening statement. The order was determined by the order on the ballot. After opening statements, candidates will answer questions and near the end of the 30-minute segment, candidates will be allowed a one-minute closing statement. Now the opening statement from Mr. Jerry Connolly. Thank you and good night. Um, I'm proud to represent the 11th District of Virginia and have done so for 16 years. I was proud to be named the most effective member of the entire United States Congress in the 117th Congress. I was proud just this month to be named one of the top 10 most influential Northern Virginians by Northern Virginia Magazine, and I'm proud to have been reelected for the only the first time in 70 years as the president of NATO's Parliamentary Assembly. But elections are about choices, and there are clear choices in this election between myself and my opponent. I favor f reproductive freedom for women in my district and throughout the United States. My opponent opposes that reproductive freedom. I favor a robust United States support for our ally, Ukraine, that is fighting valiantly against Russia's Putin. My opponent opposes that aid to Ukraine. And I favor supporting and enhancing the role of our federal employees. I represent the third largest number of federal employees in the country. My opponent has said he'd like to relocate federal employees. He says that would improve their quality of life. I don't know any federal employees in my district who thinks that's true. In fact, when the Trump administration experimented doing that with USDA, the Department of Agriculture, it created havoc, morale problems, and almost everybody who was relocated quit rather than to move to another state. I believe that we have to support and enhance our federal employees. I think that's one of the most sacred duties of representing the 11th Congressional District, and I'm going to continue to do that with all my might. I'm going to fight for women's reproductive rights, and I'm going to fight hard to make sure Ukraine has the resources and the equipment and the training it needs to defeat one of the most depraved dictators in our lifetime, Vladimir Putin. And I believe those are values shared by the overwhelming majority of my constituents in the 11th District. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Now the opening statement from Mr. Van Meter. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. And, and thank you for the League of Women Voters. And uh, my name is Mike Van Meter, and I've served this nation for over 32, year, 32 years now as a helicopter pilot in the U.S. Navy, as a police officer in Washington, D.C., as an FBI agent for almost 21 years, and now I work as a, uh, an addictions counselor at a major hospital in, in Northern Virginia. <clears throat> I've seen firsthand the devastation of the fentanyl crisis that we've seen. My opponent's never seen that. He's never been to the hospital, into the unit where I work. And I can tell you, every single person that is watching this show right now either knows of someone, is someone, or works with someone that has an addiction issue, a serious addiction issue. And the number one uh, cause of death of people between the ages of 18 and uh, 39, uh, 49 right now is fentanyl. It is out of control, and the numbers go up every single month. There's not one month where those numbers go down. And we have another drug that's coming down the pike, and that's xylazine, which makes fentanyl look like child's play. Fentanyl is coming across the border, which my opponent has lifted no, made no effort to secure that border whatsoever. We have drug dealers, we have uh, human traffickers, we have intelligence officers, we have terrorists, we have gang members, we have criminals, we have people that are criminally psychotic coming across the borders. And I vow 
to protect this nation because the, the number one role of any government to include this government is the protection of its people. Furthermore, I'm going to make sure that our ally in the Middle East, Israel, is supported, defended, and our military, which I served in and my opponent did not, is going to be the best equipped, best trained, and best suited to defeat any, any enemy that we are facing, which right now our biggest threat is actually communist China, and that's what I plan on doing once I uh, am elected into Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Meter. Okay, so now we will start with the question and answer portion of the forum. Starting with Mr. Connolly, the first question is, do you believe measures are necessary to strengthen legal protections against discriminatory voting policies and practices, including for disabled individuals, formerly incarcerated individuals, and recently naturalized citizens? If so, what would you propose? I believe that uh, we should expand the franchise uh, and protect that franchise. Uh, Republicans, including mega Republicans like my opponent, uh, have engaged in voter suppression in every state where they take control. Uh, we had a Republican mayor just the other day actually purloin, capture a, a voting drop box rather than let voters legally drop off their votes. Uh, we have Republicans accusing uh, you know, people of uh, falsely voting in elections as immigrants or non-citizens when in fact the data shows that's almost non-existent. They focus on election fraud as if that were a huge issue. The big issue in America is 40% of us don't vote, even in presidential elections. We got to make it easier, as we have here in Virginia. You can vote 45 days before an election here in Virginia. You can vote at satellite voters. You can vote easily by mail. We automatically can sign you up and mail you a ballot to make it as easy as possible for you to participate in your democracy. Nothing is more sacred than casting that vote and protecting that vote, whether it be for protected groups, whether it be for the disabled, whether it be for naturalized citizens, or restoring voting rights to people who have served their time in prison. Um, and I was proud of the fact that a Democratic governor, Terry McAuliffe, did just that. Um, I believe that's a sacred obligation. I'm sorry Republicans have blocked the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, which I support. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Mr. Van Meter. Yeah, thank you for the question. And uh, all of us, and by the way, one thing I agree with uh, my opponent on is the fact that only 40% of all Americans vote. And I think that that's something that's tragic. I think that, you know, particularly somebody like myself that has fought for this nation, that we must vote. And, I, and we need to encourage as many people to vote as we can. Now, I don't believe that any American watching us here tonight believes that anyone that is here illegally should be voting. My opponent and the Democrats seem to be hell-bent on getting as many illegal aliens to vote as possible. That should not be allowed. There's no nation on earth that would allow non-citizens to vote in their elections, and we should not be doing here. We need to protect that vote because, as Jerry mentioned, the vote is sacred. We must. We must protect the right. You know, our men and women in the armed, force, in armed forces, and for uh, a couple of centuries now, have been working diligently to protect your right to do that. Uh, we need to have as many people vote as we can, but we must make sure that it is legal. And when it comes to people that were formerly incarcerated, if you were convicted of a misdemeanor, absolutely, you should have that, that right to vote, and you do. Convicted felons, that's another uh, story. As a former law enforcement officer, I think that anyone that is a convicted felon, you forfeit that right. And, and it should remain that way. We do not want murderers, rapists, and pedophiles voting in elections and deciding on the future of our government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Meter. Okay, next question, starting with Mr. Van Meter. Like many other parts of the country, Northern Virginia <coughs> faces a housing crisis in terms of both supply and affordability. How would you propose addressing this issue? No, oh, thank you for the question. Well, number one, Northern Virginia is, you're aware, is incredibly expensive to live in. Uh, my opponent mentioned the fact that I, I would like to see federal workers related to, uh, relocated to other areas. Uh, unlike my opponent, I was a federal worker that was transferred here when I was an FBI agent. And the fact is that the majority of FBI agents I work with uh, really don't want to move to this area because of the price of, uh, the cost of living rather, uh, in this area. We need to reduce the, the cost of living because if you're a young person like my children who are both young adults right now, you can't live in this area. You can't. 
And the Democrats keep proposing tax after tax after tax, which my opponent has done many, many times in his 16 years in Congress and on the Board of Supervisors. We need to address the, the, the tax issue here in Northern Virginia. And we also need to look at the housing industry and look at deregulation. We need to look at inflation. And we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that as well. We need to ensure that the energy costs in this country go down because the, the increase in energy costs have, have driven literally the price of everything up. And we need to address that. And we're going to do that. And we'll do that day one in office. And I assure you that uh, that's one of my top priorities when I get into office. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Mr. Connolly. Well, I think the question was about housing, uh, not only the cost of housing, but the availability and access to affordable housing. Uh, when I was chairman of Fairfax County, I launched an affordable housing initiative. Uh, we preserved 2,500 units of affordable housing. We dedicated a penny on the tax rate, first time ever in our history, which was worth then $27 million, to that preservation effort. We started a homeless initiative that reduced homelessness in Fairfax County over five years by 40%. Uh, we built workforce housing on the government center property because we felt if we weren't willing to do it, we can't ask others to do it. I've been a champion of affordable housing just this week. I was proud to turn dirt uh, at a groundbreaking at, at First Presbyterian in Fairfax City where they're building affordable housing with our support and with federal support uh, on their own property. Um, so we're getting a lot of people engaged in the, in the program of making sure we have workforce housing, we have transitional housing, we have affordable housing, so people can live close to where they work and we can reduce congestion. Um, the more we can build housing uh, and the more we can preserve affordable housing, the more we can bring down housing costs and make it more affordable. I'm pleased that the Federal Reserve reduced uh, the interest rate by a half a point, which is going to affect and is affecting the price of mortgages, making more housing more available to more people. Thank you. Okay, next question, starting with you, Mr. Connolly. Large data centers have become a major point of contention in Northern Virginia in terms of their impact on the energy grid and overall environmental footprint. What, if any legislation, would you support to regulate where such centers are located and how they operate? Well, data center location is a local issue. It's not a federal issue. Um, we are, all of us, going to need data centers, especially as a, uh, artificial intelligence expands. But location, uh, citing them, is going to be critical. We have to preserve the environment. We have to preserve neighborhoods. Here in Fairfax, I think we've done a really good job of that. Um, other counties nearby are struggling with that because they are lucrative in terms of tax revenue generated. They don't generate a lot of cars, but they do generate a lot of noise. Uh, and obviously neighborhoods don't want to live near data centers. So trying to figure that out at the local level I think is going to be key. Um, making sure we have the energy that those data centers consume is also going to be a big challenge for us nationwide. The grid is not going to be adequate uh, for future uh, power-up needs for the technology advances that we're experiencing, including at data centers. Um, so th it's got to be a partnership between the federal government, state government, and local government, but ultimately data centers are going to be decided at the local level, not the federal level. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Mr. Van Meter. Yeah, I actually agree with Mr. Connolly on this one. It is a, it is a local level, uh, local issue. And, uh, but we need to partnership with them. And, and look at this, one of the concerns that I, I have uh, not just the noise and not just uh, the, the, it, it, the data centers are unsightly. And it is a bigger issue for counties outside of Fairfax. I don't know that it's a, a large issue in Fairfax County. Um, but as someone, again, as a military veteran and someone that studies history, I am concerned about the encroachment of data centers onto our uh, holy uh, sites are, are, are Civil War battle sites, and that's something that has been near and dear to me, and I think that we need to take a hard look at. But that's something that I, and as a member of Congress, I can try to influence the local governments to uh, take a look at. Um, I, it just does seem to me, though, that the local governments are going against the will of the people in those areas. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of people that favor the, um, the data centers being as close to the residential areas as they are, and I would in influence that. I, I am I'm also concerned about the energy that these 
uh, take and, and whether the grid can, can sustain that. And furthermore, I'm concerned about the national security aspect of our, our power system in general because I do think that that, I, in fact, I know that this is a vulnerability area that we have uh, and it makes it a national security issue. So we need to address that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Van Meter. Okay. Next question, starting with you. Mm -hmm. What measures would you support or yeah. oppose regarding access to reproductive health care, including IVF? Mm -hmm. Well, I've been very clear that I personally am pro-life. Uh, I believe that uh, abortion should only be uh, conducted when, it's, when it comes to the life of the mother. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm very staunch about that. But as, as you know, this issue has been kicked over to the states. This is a state issue. And the state, it's, that's where it should be. I believe that that's something that uh, it, it is where it needs to be, and that, that's a state issue. Uh, for my Democrat friends that believe that this is an issue, the number one issue for them, and I do believe that that's something the Democrats in this particular election cycle are really hanging their hat on, they should be happy because abortion is legal here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And in fact, abortions have gone up since uh, the overturning of Roe v. Wade. So as far as I'm concerned, this is not a federal issue. It is a state issue. If you want to support abortion, then talk to your state representatives. But right now, uh, the state legislature is in Democrat hands. And so if that's an issue that's important to you, then sh you should be satisfi satisfied with that. Thank you, Mr. Van Meter. Mr. Connolly. Well, the name of my party is the Democratic Party, not the Democrat Party. Um, and uh, this is where I fundamentally disagree with my opponent, and I think it really does present the choice in very stark terms for our constituents. I believe in the fundamental right of every woman in America to control her own body. I believe it's her right to decide on her reproductive choices, and she deserves, enshrined in law, as Roe v. Wade did, the right to make those choices for herself and a decision between herself and her doctor. Mr. Van Meter, would have you believe that this is fine at the state level. Look at the chaos that has been unleashed by Samuel Alito and the conservative uh, Republicans on the Supreme Court since they overturned Roe v. Wade. They have created enormous hardship. We've already had one death we know of in Pennsylvania because somebody couldn't access abortion. Uh, Republicans, when they took over, not only want to limit abortion and eliminate it in many cases, they want to make it illegal for a woman to go out of state to get an abortion. They want to penalize doctors and nurses and other medical personnel who help provide assistance or even abortion counseling. This is fascism of the first order of magnitude. This is a terrible step backward for men and women and families who face very difficult choices many times. I favor reproductive freedom. My opponent does not. That is one of the clear choices in this election. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Okay, next question, starting with you. What actions should be taken to promote gun safety and prevent gun violence? I believe very much in reasonable gun control. I favor universal background checks and have voted for them. I favor a, a, a banning, again, assault weapons and have advocated for that all of my career. Um, I favor closing the gun show loophole. I favor making sure that if one is going to own a gun, it has to be done safely. I favor holding people responsible who don't do that. Uh, and uh, I believe that guns have to be controlled in America. We have more guns than people. Gun, gun accidents, gun deaths, gun suicides are now the largest single cause of death for young people in America. More than disease, think about that. Almost every year, we have as many gun deaths in America as we lost in the entirety of the Vietnam War. Uh, that's an astounding statistic. Where countries have exercised reasonable gun control measures, they have eliminated uh, mass killings. We have one almost every week in America. It's become part of the background. In fact, the Republican vice presidential nominee says it's just something we've got to live with. I don't think so. It's madness. We've got to control it. Most Americans agree with that point of view, and certainly an overwhelming majority of people in my district believe we need r robust, sensible gun control measures to protect the public and their kids in schools. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Mr. Van Meter. Yeah, actually, uh, one, one correction, the number one cause of death of young people in America today is fentanyl. 
And that's something that my opponent is doing absolutely nothing to curtail, has done nothing to, to curtail it, and he's been in Congress for 16 years. Now, when it comes to guns, um, in Chicago, we have between 50 and 70 shootings a week. That's a Democrat-led city. I was a police officer in Washington, D.C. Shootings every weekend, Democrat-led city. Okay, these are issues that we can deal with if we have a robust law enforcement system and we keep violent criminals behind bars when they commit violent crimes. The fact is, it's a very small percentage of people that commit violent crimes in the United States, but yet Democrat prosecutors let them out time and time again, which is something that Jerry Connolly supports. And that's something that we need. Every time there's a shooting that occurs, you, you've committed a felony and you should be put behind bars and kept behind bars. We need to be strong in law enforcement. We need to be strong on crime. And these are things, we, we have a second amendment and we have a right to protect ourselves. We have a right to do that. And we need to address the mental health issue in this country, which is really the cause behind all these mass shootings, which Jerry Connolly has really done nothing about. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Meter. And uh, we are starting to receive questions from the audience. Thank you so much for those that are calling in. So we'll start with you, Mr. Van Meter. This is from Glenn in Fairfax County. Their question is, Jewish Americans are facing more threats of violence mm -hmm. on college campuses and when attending religious services. Mm -hmm. Why hasn't there been an investigation into these instances? Well, you have an elected member of Congress sitting right over there. Maybe you ought to ask him. That is something that I can tell you, Glenn, and thanks for the question, when I'm in office, we are going to look into. It is abhorrent what's happened to our Jewish friends here and our Jewish citizens. Israel was attacked on October 7th. Let's make no mistake about that. Israel is defending itself right now. And by the way, not only is Israel defending themselves, but they're defending us. I can tell you, I worked in that field for many, many years. And the increase in anti-Semitism is unacceptable. And in Congress, I'm going to address that issue. Our friends in Congress don't seem to be interested in this. And, and it's been an exponential increase in violent crime against uh, our Jewish uh, citizens here. And we need to do something about it. And I and fully intend on doing something about that when I'm in Congress. So thanks for the question. Thank you, Mr. Van Meter. Mr. Colony. Anti-Semitism is abhorrent. And I've spent all of my career and my, my life fighting it. Um, you know, when uh, the Jewish Community Center was attacked by anti-Semitic graffiti, um, I helped lead the community in um, expressing sympathy and showing up in solidarity with the Jewish community. It was a very moving moment in our district. My opponent was not there. Um, I voted in Congress uh, on a number of resolutions condemning anti-Semitism, including the phrase from the river to the sea, which I believe is an anti-Semitic expression aimed at not expressing uh, Palestinian uh, uh, sensitivity, but actually calling for the removal of Jews from Israel. That's wrong, that's anti-Semitic, I condemn it. Um, but you know, we have Republicans in Congress and Republicans at the national level who play around with anti-Semitism. Marjorie Taylor Greene, a Republican Congresswoman, talked about forest fires and wildfires in California being caused by Jewish lasers. Uh, the trope against George Soros gets named, you know, and brought up by Republicans many, many times. It's an anti-Semitic trope. Even Donald Trump has said, well, if Jews vote for Democrats, they're hurting their own cause. I don't know, they're not really Jews. Uh, these are anti-Semitic uh, whistles that I think do a lot of harm to America. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Mr. Connolly, thank you. Next question, starting with you. Um, this is from Deborah in Fairfax. What can candidates do to solve the literacy crisis in the U.S. because it leads to more problems? Because it leads to more problems. Yeah, uh, literacy is a key uh, to uh, all kinds of open doors in terms of opportunity in America. And if you don't have that, um, you're going to find yourself economically disadvantaged, you're gonna find life very, very hard uh, in its struggle. Um, I've been a strong advocate and gone almost every year to the award ceremony for people who graduate from the Literacy Council's program here in Fairfax County. I've been a strong supporter of it, helped fund it. 
Um, at the federal level, we've funded all kinds of literacy initiatives, often, by the way, in the face of uh, Republican opposition, because they don't want to make that kind of investment in America. Investing in human capital, including literacy, is one of the smartest investments we can make. It has a powerful return on it, and it can transform lives. I've seen people who don't speak English, for example, uh, and have difficulty with literacy of all kinds, who go to enormous lengths to try to improve their lives. Uh, they take you know, multiple forms of transportation to go to school at night after working at least one job and trying to raise a family. So they can master English and they can master reading and writing in English to better their lives, to improve quality of life for their families. Those are noble and courageous acts by those people. I fully support the resources needed to assist those people with a hand up so that they can succeed and enjoy the opportunity the rest of us have in America. Okay, so we have two minutes left within this segment and I wanna make sure you both have time for your closing remarks. So if you want to address that question in your closing, please, Mr. Van Meter, feel free to do so. Okay, well, thank you for the question. Yeah, literacy is, is very, very important. Um, there's a direct correlation between um, Ill, being illiterate and crime rates in the United States. And we need to do everything that we can to ensure that as many Americans are as literate and educated as we can. You know, I mentioned earlier fentanyl. Um, those of you high school students, if you're watching, or parents, if you're watching, you know that fentanyl is destroying schools, drugs are destroying schools, and uh, gangs are destroying schools. So we need to make our schools safe as we can and so our students can learn because the more literate you are, the less chances you are, uh, chance of you uh, committing crimes. Um, now, one, one final thing is, is we have less than a minute here. One thing I want to address, uh, Mr. Connolly has mentioned the word fascist twice tonight. For you veterans and for those of you that choose to disagree with Mr. Connolly, I want you to, re to realize that he's referred to you as a fascist, which I think is interesting because you're, you're looking at a man that has served his nation his entire life to serve the military. Many of you have served the military as well. We went over, people like us went over to Europe and defeated actual Nazis during the Second World War and if called upon today, we would go and defeat them as well. Jerry Connolly never served in uniform, would not serve in uniform, failed to serve in uniform, and in fact encouraged others to do the same thing. I'm going to stop And I tell you, we will, uh, that I'm, is something that you need to remember, the name calling and the rhetoric. I'm going to stop, stop you, Mr. Vayner. Okay, Mr. Connolly, you're closing. You know, uh, my opponent just talked about fascism. I don't believe you can read Project 2025 and not mm -hmm. conclude that that is a fascist blueprint for America. It would, it would affect so many aspects of life and very deleteriously, it would constrict rights. I favor expanding rights. And I've spent my whole life doing that. And I've served my country, maybe not in uniform, but I've served my country and I've served it well. I'm proud to have been elected the president of NATO's parliamentary assembly. That means I'm president of all 32 parliaments in NATO. And I'm fighting fascism, Putin's fascism, which my opponent doesn't wanna do. I support helping Ukraine, and I believe my constituents support that. Um, I believe that fight is about authoritarianism and fascism, Russian style versus Western democratic liberal values, which we share and we must defend. My opponent does not. I'm proud to have served as your congressman, and I look forward to doing it again for two more years. And thank you so much for joining us here on Inside Scoop. Mr. Connolly, thank you so much for joining us. Mr. Van Meter, thank you so much for joining us. Best, wish, best wishes in your races. And please join us. Don't go anywhere as we continue with Congressional District 10, the candidate forum. You made your house a reality. Homeschooling yourself on loans, color coding listings, and flushing every toilet in a 20 mile radius. If you can ace house hunting, you can do it for retirement. Get on track with tips at aceyourretirement.org. Here's to the things that can keep us safe. Those we use all the time with hardly a thought. Those that are silently standing by to save our lives. And now, those that we carry with us everywhere we go. Many mobile devices will now bring you wireless emergency alerts, real-time information directly from local sources you know and trust. With a unique sound and vibration, you'll be in the know. Listen. I realized that I'm not perfect, but it all really started to change because you judge me for having a problem. No one is going to know that I need help. I need help 
I know that no one is going to judge me for having a problem. I realize that I'm not perfect, but it all really started to change because you listen. a short trip or a long haul estimated time 47 hours they will beg you're hungry i'm happy to provide they will plead deep, deep fried, fried butter on a stick. stick but whatever you do don't wimp out now you're talking make them buckle up they can't hurt remember safety first cheese curls <laughs> second are you orange to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. And thank you so much for joining us here back on the Inside Scoop for the Congressional District Forum. Now we are in segment, um, segment two for Congressional District 10. Now we will hear from the candidates, um, Suha Subramanian and Subra Subramanian over here, and Mike Clancy. The first two minute opening statement will be from Suha Subramanian. Thank you so much to League of Women Voters and all the other organizations who helped uh, sponsor this event. Uh, I'm Suhas Subramaniam, the state senator in Loudoun County. I'm running for the U.S. Congress in Virginia's 10th District. Uh, first, I want to um, you know, uh, take a minute to think about the folks affected by Hurricane Helene and, and um, all those who have been affected. I know there's some first responders in, in Prince William County who have re responded to that. I know the governor and both U.S. senators and our congressional delegation are also working on trying to get people mm -hmm. what they need. So our heart is out to them, and we'll be thinking about them. Uh, I, I'm running for the U.S. Congress because I want to make sure we take on tough fights and deliver real results uh, for uh, com our community and for families like mine. Uh, I'm, uh, my wife and I got married in, in, in the 10th district and uh, my two girls who were two and four, they were, uh, they were born in the 10th district and my family, when they came from, from India in the late 70s, uh, they came through Dallas Airport, which is part of the 10th district. And so we're very invested in the future uh, and I wanna make sure that uh, we move this country forward for uh, not just the next two years, but for the next 20 or 30 years. And so part of that means working together, uh, uniting where the divides are today. And that means taking on tough fights. I did that as a state senator. I worked across the aisle to deliver real results uh, when it came to rising costs, like the costs of, of tolls and utility bills and prescription drug pricing. And I want to make sure that we t take on those tough fights in Congress, because right now th there's a lot of dysfunction right now, uh, a lot of people fighting, a lot of people who care more about uh, um, you know, getting their name out there and being famous than, than actually delivering results. And so uh, when I think about what we can do in Congress, I think about all the issues that we have to address, like our economy and, and education and immigration. And, and I think about how those are tough issues to take on. But if we work together, if we work across the aisle, uh, we can deliver real results. And that's what I did as a state senator and in the General Assembly, and that's what I plan to do in the U.S. Congress. So thank you for joining us, and I look forward to the questions today. Thank you, Mr. Subramanian. Mr. Clancy. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Clancy, the Republican nominee uh, for Congress. And my mission in running for Congress is to restore America. The Biden-Harris economy is crushing Virginia families. High prices, record credit card debt, depleted savings. And the Biden-Harris day one decision to open our border to massive illegal immigration has been catastrophic and a danger to our community fentanyl in our high schools, MS-13 gangs in our community, over 300,000 children missing across the country, and over 400,000 convicted criminals have been released into our country under the Biden-Harris catch and release policy. And that includes 13,000 convicted murderers and 16,000 criminals convicted of sexual assault. Virginians are demanding change. They want this country to go in a new direction. And as your congressman, I will lead the way. I'm a husband and dad. My wife, Lynn, and I are the proud parents of four sons. I've spent many years coaching baseball and basketball, and I've been at the school board fighting for our, our children and fighting for parents' rights. I'm a business leader, a senior vice president with a global technology company. I served on Governor Youngkin's cybersecurity team, and I'm honored to have the governor's endorsement. My opponent is a career politician with an extreme radical liberal voting record 
and he be a rubber stamp for those same failed Biden-Harris policies. People are demanding change. Virginians are demanding a new direction. And as your congressman, I'll lead the way. I'm going to Congress to serve you, to work for you, to fight for your future, and to restore America. I'm Mike Clancy, and I'd be honored to have your vote. Thank you, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you, Mr. Clancy. Okay, now we're entering the question and answer portion of the evening of the second segment. Starting with you, Mr. Subramanian. First question, Northern Virginia has some of the most vibrant immigrant communities in the country. The last Immigration Act was in 1986, and the Basic Immigration and Nationality Act dates to 1965, a much different world. Congress failed to pass comprehensive reform this election year. What, measure, what measures would you support to modernize our immigration laws? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I come from an immigrant family. When my parents came here in the late 70s, they got their green card within months, uh, not years. And now I, I talk to a lot of families in the 10th district uh, and uh, talk to some of my neighbors, in fact, who have been waiting for 10, 15 years uh, to be able to even get a green card appointment uh, because of uh, the lack of updates to our immigration uh, system. And so what I want to do is comprehensive immigration reform. It starts with two things. One, making sure we address illegal immigration and making sure even if someone is here on an H-1B visa for, for more than five years or so, that we're at least changing their status. Because I, I hear a lot of families who, you know, they, they really contribute to our economy. A lot of businesses who really rely on programs like H-1B who are unfortunately concerned about uh, the future. And if we're not addressing immigration, uh, we're not addressing our economy in a lot of ways. And uh, being open to immigration, legal immigration, uh, was what made our community in the, in the DMV and especially in the 10th District uh, so vibrant and strong. I also want to make sure that we address uh, security uh, along the border and security even at Dallas Airport, making sure that we, we curb uh, illegal immigration. And uh, we do something to address uh, that as well. And I know that there was a bill in the U.S. Senate uh, to address that, but unfortunately because Donald Trump decided he didn't want to uh, take it on, he wanted to make an election year issue, uh, Republicans didn't act. And so I think it's time to act. It's time to make sure that we address this head on in a meaningful way. And I plan to do that in Congress. And this is a tough fight that I want to take on. Thank you so much. Mr. Clancy. For four years, uh, the Biden-Harris administration has operated our border as a wide open gateway to massive illegal immigration. And they have facilitated that with over 90 executive orders. They've spent $150 billion to support illegal immigration. Priority number one for immigration reform is secure our border. We must end the catch and release policy. We must end sanctuary cities. We must have strong collaboration between local and federal law enforcement to enforce illegal immigration laws and to ensure the safety of our community, to fight the fentanyl crisis, to fight human trafficking. The bill might referenced by my opponent was an election year ploy. Democrats have had control of that border for four years. They could, just as they issued executive orders to open the border, they could have issued executive orders to close the border. And my opponent has endorsed all of those open border policies. In fact, he took action in the Virginia Senate to promote benefits for illegal immigrants and to vote it on legislation that would obstruct uh, local law enforcement from working with federal law enforcement in dealing with illegal immigrant crime. It's a radical liberal agenda. We need to secure the border and then we need to deal with the issues of legal immigration. I talked to a South Asian Indian at a dinner one night who told me it took 17 years to get a green card. And that is unacceptable. We need to reform the system, streamline the system so that the green card process works more appropriately for those who are trying to do legal immigration. Thank you, Mr. Clancy. Next question starting with you. Oil and natural gas prices reflect global, not just U.S., supply and demand. Renewable energy is by its nature domestically produced. What legislation would you support that encourages domestic energy production that is environmental, environmentally friendly and controls cost? Sure, we, we need an, uh, an all-American, all-the-above energy policy. When the Biden administration took power, their first the first executive, one of the first executive orders issued by the, by the Biden-Harris administration was to shut down the Keystone Pipeline. That cost 11,000 jobs on the, since the soon as that, that order was signed. We need to reverse those types of policies. We need to unleash American energy. We need to unleash natural gas. 
The Biden-Harris administration also closed off oil and gas permits on federal, on federal uh, property. The most environmental friendly, envi most environmental friendly oil production is in the United States, not in Venezuela, not in Russia. We need to unleash American energy. We need to invest in geothermal energy. We need to look at other alternative forms of energy like small module nuclear reactors and hydrogen batteries. Those will all help uh, the economy and help bring down prices because energy prices govern inflation. My opponent has pushed forward a, uh, and voted for what was called the Clean Economy Act. And what that did was accelerate the shutting down of fossil fuels faster than they could be replaced by new innovative technology. As the end result, Virginia is now buying energy from coal plants in Virginia and Pennsylvania. It was a radical liberal policy that just did not work and failed economically and caused ratepayers to pay more, including 11 percent increase just in the past year. Thank you, Mr. Clancy. Mr. Subramanian. I think the, the best way to address energy for the next 20 to 30 years is by making strong investments in renewable energy. And, and that's what that Clean Economy Act bill did. Uh, we also want to make sure that we're um, not only investing in the technology, that we're not reliant on other countries when it comes to energy. Uh, for instance, right now, a lot of our battery, uh, battery production is coming from China. And uh, you know, we're way too reliant on, on one particular country, one that uh, we're having difficulties when it comes to diplomacy. Uh, if we are able to make more battery production in the United States, for instance, that's going to be good for our economy and uh, renewable energy is the future, uh, honestly. And so if we can be the renewable capital of the world, uh, we're not going to be reliant on oil and gas industry. We're not going to be reliant on foreign oil. Uh, the, the fact is, even if you have all the energy production you want in America, OPEC still controls a lot of the price. And a lot of our energy production ends up getting shipped ab uh, abroad because of the economics of it. And so uh, what we really need to do, uh, one thing I did uh, in the General Assembly is also made sure that a lot of schools and hospitals who wanted uh, solar, for instance, which the ROI was really good. The problem was the utility companies weren't al allowing the hookup fees to be reasonable, and so it ruined the ROI. And so I tried to make sure that we had reasonable uh, hookup fees, for instance. I also helped ratepayers save more than $300 million with, uh, with a historic bill that, uh, that looked at loopholes that the utility companies were using. And so I think we can do more on energy policy, okay. and I want to make sure we're the renewable energy capital of the world. Thank you so much, Mr. Subramanian. Next question, starting with you. Would you work to secure passage of the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act? Why or why not? Uh, yes, uh, I think right now, uh, you know, we, we made historic progress when it comes to voting rights uh, uh, over the past 50 years. And unfortunately, right now, that's being undermined. Um, we have two things going on. One, a Congress that hasn't really acted enough to pass legislation like this, and a Supreme Court that has been hostile to, to voting rights, unfortunately. And so I, I want to make sure that we're protecting access to the ballot. That's something that I did as a state senator in the General Assembly. Uh, I made sure that we made uh, voting uh, more accessible to people, and it's helped Democrats and Republicans. We've had historic turnout across the board uh, because now uh, people don't need an excuse to vote absentee and by mail. Uh, they, not only do they get the ballot in the mail, but they also get a stamp and an envelope, and it's made a huge difference. And I'm concerned about some of the, the policies actually happening, even in our 10th district, an uh, electoral board that was politically chosen that's unfortunately cutting off voting on weekends for working families who can't always vote on Election Day because maybe they have a job uh, that involves a long commute. And so I've tried to make it uh, more accessible and easier to vote. I've tried to make sure that we're protecting voting rights. Uh, one other thing that I worked on was making sure we have uh, fair districts and making sure that we're not disenfranchising uh, uh, voters and that the, uh, the voters are picking the elected leaders, not the other way around. And so there's a lot that I've done, but there's more work to do, uh, like the Voting Rights Act, if we want to make sure that we're protecting access to the ballot across this country. Thank you so much. Mr. Clancy. There's robust access to the ballot in this country. And my opponent talks about Virginia. Well, Virginia has 45 days of early voting and non-excuse uh, absentee ballots. There is no limitation or restriction on Virginia's voting. There is Saturday voting in Virginia. There's uh, multiple days when they, the polls are open dur during that 45-day period where the polls are open until 7 o'clock. There is no voting issue. That is really not a, not a valid concern for, for the people of Virginia. What's key in our 10th district is the economy. 
I talked to a, a single mom at a Prince William County Fair. She has two teenage sons. She's working paycheck to paycheck. Her number one issue, buying groceries. That's the number one issue. It's the economy. And the Biden and Harris administration created this chaos, created these high prices with inflationary spending sprees. Even President Obama's own Treasury Secretary warned the Biden and Harris administration about these spending sprees and that it would spike inflation and spike interest rates and it's wreaked havoc on Virginia families. We need to rein in that, that fis we need to bring fiscal responsibility, rein in the reckless spending and, and get our economy back in order in order to address inflation and make life more affordable for Virginians. And those are, you know, my opponent has endorsed all these Biden-Harris policies which have caused inflation and, and created such havoc for families. And we need to get back to fiscally responsible government. Thank you, Mr. Clancy. Okay, next question, starting with you. What kind of, what kind and level of assistance, military or otherwise, do you believe we should be providing to Ukraine? So for Ukraine, I think it's good to have a little bit of background as how we how the, the, the Ukraine situation evolved. And it really it was a result of Biden Harris weak foreign policy. It started with the debacle in Afghanistan in the in the disastrous withdrawal that signaled weakness to the to the to the world. And then by putting a stranglehold on American energy. Biden and Harris forced Europe to buy their natural gas from Russia. They did that by shutting down the Keystone Pipeline in the United States and green lighting the Nord Stream, Stream Pipeline for Russia. So Europe turned to Russia. That in turn fueled billions of dollars to, to Russia and to Putin, which allowed him to pay for his invasion of Ukraine. Now that we're in this d dilemma, we cannot let Putin run roughshod through Europe. We need to provide direct military weapons to, to support Ukraine. We need to have strong leadership to push to end the war and to bring peace to the region. We don't want to send just blank checks. Uh, we only should limit that to weapons. And any dollars that have been sent to Ukraine, we should have strict accountability on how they are being spent. But that is a, this is a situation that, again, has been caused by weak foreign policy. On the, we need to get back to peace through strength with a strong deterrent force, a strong military, and strong leadership globally. Thank you. Mr. Subramanian. Uh, um, yeah, you know, I, I, don't, I don't quite follow that logic there, unfortunately. I, I don't know what Afghanistan had to do with uh, Ukraine and the Keystone Pipeline either. The Keystone Pipeline was not viable uh, by the time Biden took office. And so I, I don't think that was ever on the table. But, uh, you know, Ukraine is really the result of uh, Putin's aggression that has spanned the past decade, really. And he's had this plan for a long time now and has been developing it. And, and if we let, uh, you know, I, I don't believe in for, forever wars. I, I want to make sure we're not um, sending an endless amount of money abroad. But we have to stop Putin's aggression because, uh, as we've seen in the past, if you allow uh, uh, an invasion of a democratically elected regime and country that in the European theater, that can lead to much greater war and greater conflict. And Putin, if he invades Ukraine, will come for Poland next. It will turn into a, a massive scale uh, uh, war. And I, I don't want to see, I want to see Ukraine be able to protect itself. And so there's a lot we can do to help Ukraine protect itself. We've already done quite a bit, and you've seen the results of that. You've seen Russia have a really hard time and expend a lot of energy. And I think our sanctions are working better than people think. And I also think that uh, in the long term, we have to show leadership in finding a, a path to peace there, a, a long-term solution there. And I think we can do that, but, but it starts really by acknowledging that the way we got here was through Putin's aggression. And Donald Trump, unfortunately, has the Republican Party following his lead which is to try to cut off funding to Ukraine and to cut off resources there and allowing Putin's aggression because I guess they're buddies. I don't know. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Subramanian. Next question. We have seen political violence in the last four years unprecedented in modern history. What will you do to help lower the temperature and promote more civil discourse? Uh, this is a great question because I, I think this is one of the most important things that, that we're facing right now. Our, our democracy has been undermined quite a bit in recent years. And uh, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, uh, we have to make sure uh, that political violence isn't the norm and the regular. And so, you know, we've seen attempts on, on, on uh, former President Trump's life, and uh, that's not acceptable. We need to make sure that the Secret Service is protecting uh, our presidents and protecting former presidents. We also need to just make sure that 
that, uh, that we unite people, and that's what I've been trying to do. Uh, and the first thing I did in the General Assembly when I was elected was I got a group of Democrats and Republicans together called the Commonwealth Caucus. The whole point was to work together, find solutions together, and also make sure that we lower the temperature in our politics and, and see each other as humans, and as people who want to solve problems. Maybe we look at this from a different angle sometimes. Uh, often we disagree on things, but, but there's a lot we can work on together. And, and I'm seeing the, the divisions in our politics actually seep into our neighborhoods, to our communities. People who used to be friends for many years are now not talking to each other. Neighbors are fighting with neighbors. And, and I think if, if we lower the temperature in our politics, it can really help unite our country. And so this is something that I've really wanted to do and I plan to do in Congress. Uh, people have asked me, are you going to work with this member of Congress who's far extreme or that member of Congress? And the answer is, I'll work with anyone. I'll try to make sure that we, we lower the temperature and get things done. And I think there's, there needs to be more people in Congress that are willing to lower the temperature uh, that's the way we're going to make change and move this country forward. Thank you, Mr. Subramanian. Mr. Clancy. The Biden-Harris administration has been a focused threat on the democracy in this country. The Biden-Harris Department of Justice issued a target memo against parents at school board meetings. The Biden-Harris administration, Department of Justice and FBI, issued a, a letter targeting Catholics who go to Latin Mass. The Biden-Harris administration orchestrated an entire censorship regime that we now know and has been revealed by Facebook in admissions to the Judiciary Committee of the United States House of Representatives. They have escalated the rhetoric. They have used this, their power in the Congress and their power in the White House to, be, to, to target free speech and to target religious liberty. And that's why we need change. We need to take this country in a, in a new direction, in a direction that respects and honors freedom of speech, that honors and respects religious liberty. And we see this divisiveness. And my opponent, while he claims and wants to claim that he's bipartisan, he's not. If you look at his voting record, it's almost 100% almost strict party lines. It's not a it's not a, it's not truly uh, a, a kind of a bilateral working together type of mentality. It's very rigid, it's very party line. We need to do get, I do agree, we need to get work past that, we need to work together to get to good solutions for the American people. Thank you, Mr. Clancy. Okay, next question starting with you. Now that the Equal Rights Amendment has met the requirements for ratification, do you support its publication and certification? Why or why not? Well, so the Equal Rights Amendment period of time to be uh, approved as an amendment to the Constitution has long since expired. Years and years ago it expired. So the, at the, 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 you have to follow the constitutional process. A process was set up for that amendment. Uh, the time's expired. And, that, and, that, and we, have a, we have a Constitution that is already based on equality. We've had the Supreme Court rule in, for example, the Harvard case that we should be we should be focused on equality and equal opportunity, and that has been enforced by our Supreme Court steadfastly for a hundred years, and we need to keep that focus. And again, the, the issue confronting our, and, and, and what has happened is that the Democrats have been pushing agendas that are frankly contrary to equality. They've been pushing, you know, these equity agendas that are prejudicial. And we've seen in these admissions programs, these equity programs discriminate against students. They discriminate against South Asian students. They discriminate against Korean students. We've seen admissions of those students decline by over 20% at the Thomas Jefferson School of Science and Technology because of equity-based discriminatory admissions programs. And the Supreme Court has folk tried to eradicate those discriminatory practices. We need to get back to following our Constitution and, get, and, and not the equity-based agenda of my opponent and his party in, the, in, in Virginia. Get back to a quality, merit-based education and admissions processes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Clancy. We will now start with closing statements. Mr. Subramanian, if you want to briefly answer that question in your closing statement, you may go ahead. Uh, yes, I, I supported the Equal Rights Amendments uh, 
uh, passage in the General Assembly, and I, I believe that we do need to pass the Equal Rights Amendment um, because uh, we still have a lot of issues. Uh, one thing we didn't really discuss, for instance, is um, women's reproductive freedom, and uh, we have to take federal action to do that as well uh, because, unfortunately, it's under attack in states across the country. And so I, I think that we have to address um, uh, women's uh, rights and women's reproductive freedom uh, in America and at the congressional level because uh, it's going to continue to be under attack otherwise. Um, I'll, I'll end by saying that, uh, you know, we talked a lot uh, about lowering the temperature. Uh, in the end, uh, you know, I worked really hard to do that in the General Assembly. And I also worked really hard on issues that people didn't really want to take up before I got there. And uh, some of my best legislation, I worked with Republicans uh, to try to get things done. I, I passed a bill to lower uh, toll rates uh, and to keep toll rates at a low rate. Uh, that, that was introduced by Republicans for many years. I turned a partisan issue into a bipartisan issue. Uh, but in the end, uh, the only way we're going to move this country forward is if we work together and unite our communities. And I think Congress right now is more divided than ever. Uh, we can do a lot to make sure that we unite. And that, that's not just in, it's, it's really in terms of finding common ground, but also in terms of the style in which we approach things. If we call the other side radical all the time and, and say divisive things, then in the end, you're, you're not going to be able to get things done with the other side. So I'm someone who's going to try to find common ground, try to unite us, and try to make sure that we can deliver results, because my kids are worth it and our community is worth it. We will now start our closing statement uh, segment of this evening, starting with Mr. Subramanian. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, the last question is about the Equal Rights Amendment. I would support the Equal Rights Amendment. I also want to make sure we're protecting reproductive freedom in America. Right now, we're seeing states like Alabama and Oklahoma uh, do abortion bans and even come after things like IVF and contraceptives and really uh, also try to criminalize women who leave the state, for instance, and uh, uh, try to get reproductive care. And so, so we really have to take federal action to protect reproductive freedom. Uh, but I, I want to end by saying that uh, you know it's really important that uh, we, uh, as we mentioned before, lower the temperature in our politics and work together. I've seen the struggles and the, the divisiveness in our politics seep into our neighborhoods where neighbors are fighting now. Uh, we're, we're seeing people divide us in so many ways. I want to unite us. I want to make sure we actually get things done, deliver real results for people. That's what I did in the General Assembly. That's what I plan to do in Congress. And if we, if we make sure we unite us, if we make sure we work in a bipartisan way, we can do a lot of great things and move this country forward because uh, you know, my kids are worth it, our future is worth it, and our community deserves it. So thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to representing you in Congress. Thank you, Mr. Zubramanian. Mr. Clancy. I'm Mike Clancy, and as your congressman, my mission is to restore America. After four years of the Biden-Harris administration, Virginians are ready for change. They're ready to move in a new and better direction. They're looking for us to repave the road to the American dream for their children and their grandchildren. And as your congressman, I'll lead the way. And that means we need to focus on the economy. We need to focus on the border security, safe communities, national security, education, the fentanyl crisis. And I'm going to Congress to fight work on those issues and to work collaboratively with all my colleagues to get to common sense solutions that work for the citizens of Virginia and the citizens of this country. I'm going to Congress to serve you to work for you, to fight for you and fight for your future and for your children. I'm going to Congress to restore America. I'm Mike Clancy, and tonight I humbly ask for the honor of your vote. Thank you and have a great night. Okay, thank you so much for joining us here on the Inside Scoop. Please make sure you have early voting right now in Virginia. Make sure you go vote early, and Election Day is November 5th. Again, thank you for joining us here on Inside Scoop, and we'll see you next week.